The origin of the word pyramid is controversial. Most believe that it originates with the Greek word pyramis, which referred to a bread of conical shape. Life and death in ancient Egypt were modeled on the cycle of the sun. The perfect shape of the smooth-faced pyramid became associated with the metaphor of the pharaoh transformed into one of the sun's rays in death. Pyramids represented the Benben, the primordial mound of the Heliopolitan creation myth. These stories permeated every aspect of Egyptian life to a greater or lesser extent. During the pre-dynastic period, the development of funerary practices was different depending on whether one was located in Lower Egypt or Upper Egypt. Well before the pyramid, there was the burial pits. It is on the site of Marimde Beni Salome in Lower Egypt that we find the oldest funerary site, dating back to 5000 BCE. Study of the tombs revealed that the bodies of the deceased were deposited in a shallow grave in a fetal position. Though a few objects were recovered from these graves, they offered no insight as to the social class of those interred within. In Upper Egypt, pre-dynastic practices are easier to study, but reveal more complex funerary rites. They are divided into two cultural phases, Bedarian and Nagata. The Bedarian phase ranged from 4400 BCE to 3800 BCE. Small necropolises were discovered on the outskirts of villages, revealing the emergence of a funerary cult. The bodies of the deceased were lowered into an oval grave and covered with goat or gazelle skins. Items needed in everyday life were added alongside the body. During the three Nagata periods ranging from 4000 BCE to 3510 BCE, funerary practices evolved in complexity. The shape of tombs changed from oval to rectangular, mimicking the homes of the living. The size of the burials increased and funerary items became more stylized and numerous. Tombs gained complexity with masonry, wooden veneers, or raw bricks added to strengthen the structures. In time, socially stratified necropolises emerged. For example, in Hierakonopolis, the elite and commoners had separate necropolises. The term mastaba, meaning massive bench in dialectal Arabic, refers to a form of funerary architecture that was present in Egypt from the Archaic period to the Middle Kingdom. An evolution of the burial pit, mastabas were generally composed of two parts. A structure was built above the ground in the form of a massive rectangle with stepped walls and a subterranean burial chamber was located underneath. Smaller mastabas often surrounded the much larger tomb of the king. These generally held the remains of the king's relatives and courtiers. The arrangement of the substructure of the mastaba evolved during the course of the Old Kingdom. From the 5th dynasty onwards, mastabas often featured multi-roomed substructures, with sometimes up to 30 rooms. Also, the quantity and quality of decorated surfaces increased noticeably, as well as the number of statues found within. The Sixth Dynasty would see art used to its utmost. The entire surface of a mastaba would be covered in scenes of daily life, illustrating the prosperity of those lucky enough to comfortably spend eternity near the pyramid of a pharaoh. The best example of this type of mastaba is the tomb of Mararuka, in Saqqara. The Giza Plateau is located on the west bank of the Nile and was considered by ancient Egyptians as the domain of the dead. The pyramidal complexes found there were built over the span of three generations during the reign of Khufu, Khafre, and Menkara. The Giza area, now famous for its three pyramids, is part of a wider grouping of funerary complexes. Rulers from this period generally elected to be buried in the area. The focal point of the entire region was the city of Memphis, chosen as the capital of Egypt at the beginning of the Old Kingdom. The placement of the Giza monuments, and particularly that of the pyramids, followed a practical yet strict alignment. 
First, they focused on cardinal points, and then they accounted for the natural geology of the plateau. Built around 2550 BCE, the Great Pyramid of Giza is considered one of the most iconic structures of Egypt. It is the biggest of the pyramids and the only one of the seven wonders of the ancient world still standing. The numbers associated to the Great Pyramid of Giza are impressive. A workforce of over 20,000 people, 6 million tons of stone, and 20 years of construction. It was a massive undertaking for a pharaoh's tomb. The construction of the Great Pyramid was also a display of power and opulence on the part of Khufu. It is part of the pharaoh's vast funerary complex, which also includes two temples, three satellite pyramids, a causeway, and a builder's necropolis. We can guess that the intent behind the construction of these monuments was Khufu's way of declaring himself one of the most powerful pharaohs to rule a unified Egypt. New insights into engineering and ancient Egyptian culture are still being revealed over 4,500 years later. For example, a recently unearthed papyrus offers a glimpse into the life of a tradesman at the time of the pyramid's construction. Also, a logbook belonging to a team leader during the building gives details on the craftsmen, their work schedules, and the raw materials required. It is interesting to note that by Cleopatra's time, the pyramid's celestial purpose, its construction, and the function of its mysterious inner chambers was already unclear. Today, it is only through dedicated research that we have begun to grasp some of the Great Pyramid's mysteries. The Egyptians had polished their design for centuries by the time work on the Great Pyramid began. Intended as a tomb for Khufu, the Great Pyramid's structural design has been considered to be nearly perfect by engineers and historians ever since. Precisely oriented north-south to the four cardinal points of a compass, the length of each side of the Great Pyramid at its base was 230 meters, and its original height was 147 meters. The pyramid is a mere 0.05% error away from being a perfect square. In order to achieve the shape of a true pyramid, the design required many considerations in the planning phases as well as precision during execution. It was especially critical that they control the angle of inclination on all sides at every stage of construction. Materials for the Great Pyramid consisted of quarried limestone blocks, weighing between 2 to 15 tons each. The methods of moving these blocks into place is still debated by architects and Egyptologists. The precision of its design in an age with only soft metal tools, as well as the enormous scale of its construction, make the Great Pyramid one of the most impressive feats of human engineering. It's estimated that it took between 600,000 and 2 million blocks of stone to build the Great Pyramid. Experts calculate it would have required men to move 12 blocks every hour around the clock for 20 years to place the 2.3 million stones the monument is made of. While the interior chambers were built with red granite from a swan, most of the pyramid was made from local limestone, weighing between 2 to 15 tons per block. There is debate on how the pyramid stones were moved into place. Recent research is exploring the idea that it was built around a large interior ramp. The recently discovered logbook confirms that the high-quality limestone of the outer casing was brought by boat across the Nile from a quarry in Tura. Once complete, the smooth white polished stone of the Great Pyramid would have reflected the sunlight like a beacon, earning it the name the Horizon of Khufu. Over the centuries, thieves and travelers attempted to access the Great Pyramid numerous times. Ancient writings describe details of its interior, proof that some made their way within, though who gained entrance first and when is unknown. The main entrance of the Great Pyramid is located 17 meters above ground level. It faces north, likely in order to align with the North Star. Though the entrance passageway had been discovered in antiquity, 
Any further access into the Great Pyramid was stopped by massive vertical slabs of rock. As such, present-day visitors to the pyramid must use the robber's entrance. The robber's entrance is reported to have been opened in the 9th century by Caliph al-Mamun. In search of treasure, the Caliph had his men dig their way inside the Great Pyramid. The most likely scenario is that they enlarged a corridor which had been created by tomb robbers during antiquity. As such, this is how the team can justify access to this wonder. Attempts to gain entry to the Great Pyramid and uncover its potential secrets continued throughout the centuries. In the 19th century, the belief that another entry existed at the south side resulted in a hole being blasted into the pyramid's side with no results for the damage that was done. While the search is still ongoing today to uncover more hidden rooms and passageways, conservation is the primary concern of all such efforts. From the original entrance of the Great Pyramid, there is a passage leading to the subterranean chamber. Its walls were carved out of the existing rock of the plateau and then covered in a fine, unmarked limestone. The descending passage has a steep 26-degree downward slope. Narrow and with a low ceiling, this pathway is long and challenging. The well shaft was a 58-meter vertical passage that connected the descending corridor to the grand gallery above. An adjacent grotto may have originally been a small natural well in the bedrock that was enlarged during the tunneling. Whether the grotto was intended for another purpose is uncertain. There is much speculation over the purpose of the well shaft. One theory is that the channel was cut or enlarged to supply air to workers in the descending passage. Another is that it was meant to provide an exit route once the work was done in the heart of the pyramid. Without the well shaft, workers would have been trapped inside forever when the grand gallery was sealed. The opening at the bottom of the well shaft was most likely sealed by exiting workers to camouflage the passageway. There is a subterranean chamber at the end of the descending corridor, 30 meters below the Giza Plateau surface. Dug directly into the bedrock, the space is wide with a ceiling 3 meters in height. Its floors and walls are rough and uneven, indicating that it was never completed. At the south end of the room, there is another narrow corridor, similar to the others, though it abruptly ends after roughly 20 meters. The subterranean chamber's original purpose remains a mystery. One popular theory is that it was originally meant to be Khufu's burial chamber, but the pharaoh changed his mind, preferring to be buried higher up in the pyramid, which would explain the chamber's unfinished state. At the entrance of the ascending passage are three granite flagstones estimated to weigh up to 25 tons each. They were used to protect the Great Pyramid from thieves. Undaunted by the granite blocks, the thieves simply dug into the softer limestone around them, thus creating the robber's entrance. The ascending passageway of the Great Pyramid provides a direct path into the Grand Gallery and is accessed 30 meters from the entrance along the descending corridor. Both corridors have similar dimensions and are designed with the same 26 degree incline. The ascending corridor has smooth masonry on its walls and the layout includes many trapezoidal stones. Both the floor and ceiling of the passageway indicate that the passage was enlarged, possibly during or after the funeral to allow workers room to move granite blocks meant to plug the corridor. The Grand Gallery's purpose is still debated among experts. It may have been intended to align with the stars, act as a buffer to protect the king's chamber, or simply to facilitate the transport of the granite blocks used inside the pyramid. Access to the queen's chamber was at the beginning of the Grand Gallery. Though this room is referred to as the Queen's Chamber, it is believed that there was no queen buried here. Based on their knowledge of earlier pyramids, Egyptologists believe it was more likely intended as the King's Serdab, a chamber meant to contain the Ka statue, which would in turn house the King's spirit. 
Situated exactly within the pyramid's center, on the east-west axis of the pyramid, the chamber has a vaulted ceiling and measures 5.7 by 5.2 meters. In the eastern wall, there is a niche tucked away in a small corbelled archway, which may have originally held the Ka statue. Behind this niche is another smaller hole, possibly dug out by thieves in search of further treasure. In the 19th century, two shafts were found running through the north and south walls. They each run in a horizontal line for two meters before sloping upward, and both are closed off with limestone blocks fitted with copper handles. Whether they were intended as ventilation shafts for workers or a celestial connection for the pharaoh's spirit is unconfirmed. A recent scan of the room indicated the presence of an unknown cavity hidden behind the north face of the walls over the descending corridor. Further investigation is still ongoing to ascertain the nature of the anomaly so as to avoid risking damage to the monument. Khufu's architects were possibly influenced by earlier rhomboidal pyramids when designing the gallery. It is the longest corbelled vault ever built, measuring 47 meters long and 8.6 meters high. The walls were made to taper inward, allowing for better distribution of weight. As a result, the ceiling measures just over a meter wide at its highest point. Though this construction technique is present in other pyramids, few have the same precision and stability. While the space is visually dramatic, the gallery seemed to serve a practical function, though what exactly remains uncertain. Still, the wall design was undoubtedly meant to contribute to the stability of the structure, and its floor may have helped workers move the materials. A channel runs along the middle of the room. A movable floor originally rested in this central recess. The raised benches on either side are equipped with slots that may have been used to help position the granite blocking stones. At the end of the grand gallery is the entrance to the antechamber leading to the king's chamber. Directly above, there is another narrower horizontal passage that connects to the top of the king's chamber and allow the workers access to the weight relief rooms. The far end of the grand gallery leads to a small antechamber with a portcullis preventing access to the king's chamber. The portcullis was composed of three separate granite slabs. They were designed to be lowered into place and sealed the chamber after the burial of the king. The grooves dug out to hold the slabs in place are still clearly visible to this day. The elaborate locking system was composed of a series of grooves for the ropes and pulleys that dropped the stones into place like the notches on a key. The king's chamber is built entirely out of red granite. The king's chamber measures 5.8 meters in height. It has an imposing cover of five stacked levels above with granite beams weighing 25 to 40 tons each. The uppermost level is surmounted by a vault of stones arranged in chevrons to bear the enormous structural load. As in the Queen's Chamber, two shafts extend out from the room towards the north and south faces of the pyramid. They measure nearly 64 meters until they are blocked by copper-handled granite plugs. Some experts in the culture of the Old Kingdom believe that the shafts were thought to lead the king's soul to the stars with the incarnation of the pharaoh as the god Ra, represented by the northern well, and the god Horus by the southern well. There is a granite sarcophagus at the west end of the room, but it is the concealed construction inscriptions left by workmen on the roof's stones which verify this as the resting place of Khufu. The sarcophagus was recorded as being empty when it was discovered and its design indicates that there was once a lid in place. It's possible that this sarcophagus is only a cenotaph in memory of the pharaoh, but was never actually meant to receive the body. Khufu's mummy was never found. It is hoped that as of yet undiscovered hidden rooms and shafts of the pyramid may provide an answer as to its location. Since the very beginning of the fourth dynasty, 
mortuary temples were built adjacent to pyramids on the eastern side. Such a location, facing the rising sun, as well as the world of the living as a whole, held an important symbolic meaning, for it was within the mortuary temple that kings were revived through daily rituals. In its standard form, a mortuary temple was divided into two parts, a front area which consisted of a vestibule and a courtyard, and an area in the back where all sacred elements were located. The back of the temple incorporated several essential features, including an inner sanctuary with a false door, which allowed the soul of the pharaoh to travel between the world of the dead and the world of the living. The largest of all such structures, Khafre's mortuary temple was entirely built with megalithic blocks of limestone from a nearby quarry and encased with granite. Parts of Khafre's mortuary temple, particularly the courtyard walls, are thought to have been decorated with splendid reliefs. However, not a single image of the king has been discovered inside the mortuary temple. Khufu's direct successor, Jedifrey, followed the custom which required each king to establish a new site for their funerary accommodation and chose Abu Rawash as his last resting place. When the time came to build his own funerary complex, Khafre, also one of Khufu's sons and the successor to Jedifre, broke with tradition and returned to Giza. Not only did Khafre thumb his nose at tradition, but he did so in a way which he hoped would allow him to overshadow his father's most important monument. Though Khafre's pyramid is smaller than Khufu's, it was cunningly built on a more elevated bedrock layer than the Great Pyramid, making it appear higher than any other pyramid at Giza. Today, Khafre's pyramid is the only one among the three at Giza that still has the upper part of its limestone casing. Considered a most sacred area, the Giza necropolis was strictly defined, both geographically and physically. An eight-meter-thick Tura limestone wall completely surrounded the Great Pyramid. The only way inside would have been through the mortuary temple. From the reign of Sneferu and onwards, the subsidiary pyramid became a common feature within the pyramidal complex. The function of the subsidiary pyramid, however, smaller in size and in height than the royal tomb, remains unclear, though some believe that it was meant to house the Ka of the Pharaoh. In mainstream media, the Ka is often defined as the soul of the deceased. The truth is a bit more complicated. Within the ancient Egyptian funerary belief system, the Ka was a component of a living person, which separated itself from the body at the time of death. It represented the deceased's vital essence. In order for the deceased to ascend to a new life, whether in this world or the next, the Ka had to be embodied in a statue and its existence maintained through offerings and rituals. Within Khafre's subsidiary pyramid, a wooden box containing pieces of cedar was discovered by archaeologists. When reassembled, it turned out to be a shrine mounted on a sled. Just as with the solar barges found around Khufu's pyramid, it seems Khafre's shrine and sled were ritually disposed of after his funeral. The dimensions of Benkara's pyramid are much less grandiose. However, unlike its predecessors, Menkara's pyramid shows a great deal of complexity in its internal and external finish. The outside was partially covered in red granite, while the internal walls were richly decorated. This latter innovation would not catch on until the end of the 5th dynasty, when pyramid texts began to adorn the walls. Menkara's pyramid contains two sloping passages, both located in the northern side of the structure. The upper one was abandoned during the construction phase, whereas the lower one, slightly above the base of the monument, constitutes the real entrance. The lower passage leads to a first room, which, for the first time since the reign of Djoser, is decorated with engraved false doors. While Menkara's pyramid complex was unfinished at the time of his death, 
It was hastily and somewhat shabbily completed by his successor, Shepsikov. Even so, this funerary structure marks a watershed in the history of this kind of monument. From then onwards, the pyramid shrank, whereas the mortuary temple expanded both in its quantitative and qualitative aspects. Of particular note, it is within Menkara's mortuary temple that one can find the heaviest block of limestone ever used for a pyramid complex, weighing in at over 200 tons. Menkara's causeway was completed in mud brick by the king's successor, whereas the lower part was nothing more than a simple ramp. As for the valley temple, it was built in two phases. The foundations were first laid out in limestone during Menkara's reign, but the temple itself was completed in mud brick afterwards. As such, the valley temple was soon damaged and ended up being completely rebuilt during the 6th dynasty. Three small structures, referred to as Menkara's Queen's Pyramids, were erected along the southern side of the main pyramid. One of them was a smooth-faced pyramid, while the other two were more basic step pyramids. It is difficult to assess whether the latter were designed as such or were left unfinished with no casing to smooth out their surfaces. The easternmost pyramid was built with the traditional rooms and corridors found within a satellite pyramid meant to house the king's ka. However, a granite sarcophagus was found within, leading to the conclusion that it was used as an actual tomb rather than as a symbolic cenotaph. Drawing on these observations, some assume that this pyramid was first built as a satellite pyramid for the king's ka before seeing its purpose change to that of a queen's tomb. Which queen, however, remains a mystery. A sphinx was originally meant to be a personification of the king. The human head, wearing pharaonic regalia, was fused with the body of a lion, thus sharing the qualities the powerful animal possessed, namely its power, the swiftness of its attack, and its majestic authority. By these very virtues, it was also considered a symbol of protection. Unsurprisingly, statues of sphinxes could be found along the dromos, protectors of the path taken by the gods to reach the temples. Over the centuries, enthusiasts and historians alike have wondered, who built the sphinx? For what purpose? And who does it represent? These questions remain unanswered. Several theories do exist, however, some more credible than others. One theory supposes that Jedifre chose to pay homage to his father Khufu by building the Great Sphinx of Giza. The stone temple on the eastern face of the Sphinx would have been added later on by his brother and successor, Khafre, in order to strengthen the divine worship of their father. It would be the first Egyptian temple oriented with the sun. Another theory suggests that the Sphinx was built by Khafre and was meant to represent him. The arguments to support this hypothesis are based on the fact that the limestone beds used for the main work of the Temple of the Sphinx are geographically and architecturally similar to the Valley Temple of Khafre. Some believe that Khufu himself built the Sphinx, which was later finished under his successors, Jedifre and Khafre. These arguments are based on the stylistics of the engraving, the typology of the nemes, and the absence of a beard at the time of construction. While ancient Egypt as a whole leaves a rather monochrome vision of its monuments and statuary, it is vital to understand that in ancient times, absolutely everything was painted. The sun eating away at the pigments of the colors, the sand, the climate, and the implacable impact of time unfortunately destroyed the glorious colors of the Sphinx of Giza. Documents from an Arab Egyptologist of the 12th century, Abd al-Latif al-Baghdadi, indicate that traces of red were still visible in his time. Today, however, the only color that remains are traces of red close to the ears of the Sphinx, 
as well as hints of blue and yellow on the neems, traditional colors for that type of headdress. The pigments for the color red were man-made, obtained by mixing different products such as clay, quartz sand, and very finely crushed hematite. Red had a strong symbolism in ancient Egypt. It was both the color of life and the color of death. It could represent the sands of the desert or the brilliance of the sun. Red was also associated with the god Seth, vengeful and destructive. The Egyptian word for red, Deshur, is also the word which was used to signify the desert or the royal crown of Lower Egypt. In art, red was also the color used to paint the bodies of men, while yellow was used for women. It is possible that there were also color restoration efforts during the Sayite period about 600 years before Cleopatra's rule, as indicated by notes on the inventory stele, discovered in 1858 by Auguste Mariette. It is because of this that the team made the decision to display it with its full range of colors, even though the Sphinx's colors would have likely faded by Cleopatra's time. Dating from the 4th dynasty, approximately 2600 to 2500 BCE, the Great Sphinx of Giza is the oldest and largest Sphinx that we know of. Carved from a natural limestone outcrop, the Sphinx measures 19.8 meters in height, 73.2 meters in length, and 14 meters in width. The Sphinx as a whole was carved in situ from a natural stone promontory. Its head was built in a limestone peak of the Mukutam plate, and the body was sculpted in the underlying rock layer where it is located. The degradation of the Sphinx is due in particular to wind erosion and the different quality of limestone used in its construction. The level of sodium contained in the groundwater which abuts the stone is also a contributing factor. The natural bedrock is seen through the oblique natural strata of the Sphinx's body that are similar to the surrounding limestone. Since antiquity, people have always believed there was a hidden tomb deep within the Sphinx. It is thought that attempts to plunder the Sphinx began as far back as the first intermediate period. Since then, numerous attempts to pierce the Sphinx's secrets have been carried out, leaving indelible scars upon the monument. While there have been no major discoveries pertaining to the Sphinx of Giza in recent years, theories and hypotheses continue to emerge. Without validation provided by archaeological sources, however, they remain unsubstantiated. The first of the main theories as to the Sphinx of Giza's meaning posits that the Sphinx was originally a massive representation of the god Anubis. Its principal arguments are that the head of the Sphinx is disproportionate compared to the size of its body. The second theory believes that the representation of two Sphinxes on the stela of Thutmose IV would indicate that another stone Sphinx had existed on the site itself, possibly even in paired symmetry on the other side of the Nile. However, neither of these theories can be verified in any way. Several scientific projects using new technologies have been put in place in the past decades. The most important was led by Mark Lehner and his team, who specialize in the study and survey of the Giza Plateau, including the Sphinx site. The mapping made it possible to see the materials used to construct the Sphinx, analyze the different layers of erosion, and figure out the most fragile areas to protect. After a few attempts at giving the Sphinx artistic proportions, the team instead decided to use photogrammetry mapping to faithfully reproduce the proportions of the Sphinx. What the Sphinx of Giza represented during its construction and how the Sphinx was perceived by the Egyptians of the New Kingdom are two very different matters. Originally a representation of the king imbued with the power of the lion, the Sphinx was eventually viewed as a direct representation of the Most Divine. It is theorized that kings of the New Kingdom believed that the Sphinx of Giza was the one who recognized and legitimized the ruler of Egypt. Thus, despite the fact the Sphinx of Giza was partially buried under the sand during his reign, Amenhotep II knew that the monument was of great importance. 
Amenhotep II built a second temple dedicated for the Sphinx as Horamakhet to pay homage to Khufu and Khafre, his predecessors. It became a common habit for this dynasty to spend time with their royal courts at the Sphinx. Its sanctuary became known as Setepet, the Chosen. Egyptologist Mark Lehner believed that Amenhotep II built a statue of himself anchored between the paws of the Sphinx, likely to legitimize his reign alongside a stela found by Salim Hassan. Many other pharaohs of this dynasty, such as Tutankhamun and Ramses II, also left marks of their passage in a similar fashion, sometimes even stripping the stones of nearby temples and pyramids to do so. Amenhotep II's son and successor, Thutmose IV, was a frequent offender. While sleeping between the Sphinx's paws, the future Thutmose IV saw in a dream the god Horamakhet proclaiming his coming accession on the throne of the two lands. This was, of course, on the condition that he remove all of the sand covering the Sphinx, which stood guard as the personification of the god and should thus never be engulfed by the sands of the desert. The 15-ton dream stela built by Thutmose IV to commemorate his dream was discovered by an Italian Egyptologist, Giovanni Battista Caviglia, in 1818 when he undertook the task of freeing the Sphinx from the sand, which had, yet again, covered it. Cavillia was looking for an entrance into the structure of the Sphinx, but instead he discovered an open-air chapel and stelas between the paws. Ashes from a ceremony were still present. Protected by sand, they quite possibly were from the last ceremonies in Roman times. A popular cultural legend purports that the nose of the Sphinx of Giza was lost during the time of Napoleon Bonaparte to the cannon fire of French soldiers in training. However, engravings from before the time of that campaign already depicted the Sphinx without a nose, indicating that it had been removed before the French campaign. The most plausible hypothesis is based on the research of the German historian Ulrich Harman. During the 1980s, Harman compiled medieval sources written by Arab authors. In doing so, he discovered that the Sphinx was once perceived as a favorable omen, a deity supporting sediment-nurturing floods and crops. Around 1378, a Sufi by the name of Mohammed Saim al-Dar could not stand this vision of the monument, and in an iconoclastic act, broke the nose of the Sphinx. According to the texts, he was then hanged and burned between the legs of the Sphinx for his crime. 